Thanks for staying with us as we continue to unpack the day's events and look back at the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu's life and send off. We are jo joined by ENCA Power to Truth anchor, Dr. J.J. Tabane. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Uh, right. Doctor, let's speak about uh, the eulogy and just the yeah. send off yeah. uh, as a whole. I think the president's eulogy was uh, really fitting and spoke yeah. about the great leader that was the Arch and how future leaders should possibly take out qualities uh, that the arch possessed. Absolutely. It's, it's an expectation that an eulogy like this must be representing how the nation feels. And I think uh, President Ramaphosa did an excellent job at, at, at that, describing in the arch as the spiritual father of the nation. I don't think anybody has described him like that in the entire build-up to this funeral. I, th I thought that was very, very apt, you know, that he, he recognizes his very, very uh, central role in being our, our, our moral compass, so to speak, but also added also our national conscience. So I think it was a, it was very, very well-rounded uh, eulogy. I didn't expect him uh, to go into saying, "Oh, this is how we're going to, uh, uh, if you like, uh, emulate him," and so on, because he knows he, he's, he was going to make promises that they won't be able to keep. So he kept it broadly to describing what, uh, uh, what legacy he leaves behind. He, he uh, listed about six or seven key things mm. uh, that, that Desmond Tutu busied himself with, including uh, you know, the issues of, of, of race, issues of, of, of uh, what you call reconciliation, issues of uh, gender, issues of also the LGBTQ plus community, all those, uh, and, and quoting very generously from some of the uh, the sentiments that the Archbishop uh, was known for in terms of uh, really uh, running theme, standing for justice, mm -hmm. and always being able to stand for those who are, 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 are oppressed uh, throughout his life. And w whatever angle you take, you'd find uh, that he was there on the side of the poor. And that's what we need to be uh, emulating. Certainly, and I think when the president actually started speaking, he said people from all walks of life and in almost every corner you find somebody having something to say about their fondest memories of the arch and also how people from the LGBTQI plus community, uh, uh, environmental activists, uh, it's almost as though everybody had something special to say about the arch because he stood for what yeah. was right, even if it wasn't popular. Yeah. And something that was so interesting for me um, I don't want to give my age away but having not uh, been able to have <laughs> covered the arch yeah. uh, I'm sure you also have lots of fun memories of him and we'll get to that but sure. uh, it's just how he was always very vocal and yeah. when you look at somebody as an archbishop you almost that's how I grew up you almost have to become so respectful yeah. and be careful what you say yeah. and be careful what you are very muted and yes, so on. But I mean, he was so know. vocal yeah. and he was always laughing and he always had something to say even if it yeah. wasn't popular absolutely in fact uh, uh, president ramaphosa painting a picture using two uh, seminal photographs first one uh, a black and white photograph that is often used was showing him standing in between the, the army or the, the security forces and the crowds during a very very seminal march back in 1989 and i think that that uh, uh, you know uh, you know that kind of imagery just tells you what you know what that what kind of uh, gravitas mm -hmm. he had. You know, uh, he was not just a normal, you know, archbishop that you can just you know ignore, but somebody who, uh, in fact, somebody suggested that the police feared that if they touch this one, there will be uh, trouble. But at the same time, he was also human. And and the second photograph that the, uh, the president referred to was a president the, the photograph of him weeping at the TRC. Uh, 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 you know, almost. A, a, you know, a sense of empathizing with those who came there to tell stories of how horrible apartheid was uh, to them. I think that that was also something else that here's somebody who's, who has a, a, you know, a steely uh, character who can stand in, in front of an army and say, stop your nonsense, mm. but also can be able to uh, just be human and break down uh, in, a, in the face of horror stories that were being told at the TRC. Most certainly, and, and just also being emotionally invested to say, uh, this is a moment where I need to show my emotions. The president said he never stopped smiling and fighting. And I think that was very profound because uh, 
as difficult as it was to be part of that TRC and uh, mm. to be part of sitting and listening to those horrifying stories, he still found a way to say, at the end of the day, you must smile. At the end of the day, you must find yeah. joy in, in these hardships and, and uh, what life presents you. Absolutely. I mean, I, I expected the president to go a little bit deeper on the TRC because uh, uh, there's a, there's a, lot of, a big debate has been was a C, the TRC a, a success or not? And, and, and I think uh, over coverage, there were a couple of people who suggested, do yourself a favor, go and read. I know it's five volumes of a report of a TRC, but we need to read what was recommended there. Because for me, the key thing is we did not listen to him. Everybody say he spoke truth to power, etc. But did we listen? What did he really say, right? yes. Uh, even with the TRC, we didn't listen. He's one of his key recommendations, and there are many, but one of the key ones that was totally ignored uh, by, that, by this administration right, was the issue of reparations. They gave people 20,000 and so I mean just insult people. Mm -hmm. You know if you have lost your family, you know you have lost everything and then you are given 20,000 as a sorry of four decades or five decades of apartheid rule and 300 decades of co colonialism. It's a, it's a terrible insult. Mm -hmm. But what was worse was that after she, he did all that he did as a TRC to lead that process People still feel there is a, a sense that there's no closure mm -hmm. because people haven't prosecuted. The NPA has dragged its feet up to now. They haven't prosecuted a single person, you know, uh, after all the atrocities of apartheid, you know. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, when he had recommended the wealth tax, right, uh, which was appropriate for a country with, with so much mineral wealth and all these mining companies who are making billions at the back of migrant labor system, at the back of basically apartheid. And then you go and, 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 and ignore that, you know. Obviously, I didn't expect the president to go I into that, but I thought, you know, a reflection that says we still have to do more. Because remember, that report is still there. It's not disappeared. Yeah. And there's nothing stopping us from going back to that report as part of paying tribute to Archbishop Desmond Tutu and do something about those recommendations. Yeah. I don't think it's too late. I think we should, I mean, I think I should also go back and read because uh, just speaking to certain, no, I yeah. mean, it, it's true, you're yeah. right. We, we should be holding those uh, accountable and questioning the MPA on why nothing has been done. And uh, it was, there was an interesting interview that I had done with former President Thabo Mbeki yeah. where he said, you know, we've all lost people and Absolutely. what has actually been done here. Yeah. I want us to go into the interview that senior reporter Aisha Ismail did with Mampela Rampele. Mm. And I found that to be really um, outstanding, where she said yeah. funeral services, funerals should be a service and yeah. not a show. Yeah. And the giant that the arch was, you would think he would have such an extravagant yeah, farewell absolutely. and um, funeral and send off. But it was so simple, yet so beautiful. Yeah. But there was a deeper message in what she actually said, wasn't there? Absolutely. In fact, uh, the, 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 the arch so humble that his required mass, as we were talking about earlier, is exactly what you would get if you were Anglican and you were just an, an, an ordinary congregant who passed away. That full service that you saw there, that's exactly what you will get if you ask for it uh, as, as, as a required must. So he didn't want an, uh, something that is out of kilter with what is, what is offered to an ordinary uh, uh, you know, congregant. But of course he was the Archbishop of Southern Africa, first black Archbishop of Southern Africa. I really uh, uh, was a bit sad that the Archbishop of Canterbury, who described him as the Archbishop, right, uh, did not uh, uh, find a way to come uh, to, to this send off, but at least he sent a message uh, via video. But coming to funerals, I think if we don't learn from this, I don't know. So many of our big leaders have passed away over the years and we've given them all this, you know, military extravagant funerals, etc. And here comes the arch, disruptive yet again, <laughs> disrupt our very thinking, you know. Uh, to look at that coffin, I mean, a lot of people will send him messages to say, no, but this is beyond now. Mm. You know, this, this coffin, I mean, is, you know, he may even fall out of it. It's so basic, <laughs> you know. Me, hopefully not. Uh, so, but, but the key message, as Rampela, Rampela was saying, we must stop this thing of mm. turning funerals into extravagant show-offs. Mm -hmm. And I was saying earlier on to the colleagues earlier to say, part of what triggers such lavish funerals is this guilty conscience. Mm. A lot of parents in this country, right, starve with, with children who are waking. You find that a, a child is, a, a, you know, a, a son or a daughter of somebody is waking and, you know, having a good life here in Johannesburg. But back at home, the, 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 the parent is starving or is dependent on social grants and so on. And, you, and then comes the funeral. 
the money they could have used to sustain that person mm -hmm. for years and years. They go and buy a big casket of 200,000 and what have you, and, and throw a lavish thing. You know, and I think that what uh, uh, Archbishop has done is to highlight this thing. And we, we hardly talk about it. I mean, I listen to talk radio and so on. You fi hardly find people talk about this thing about funerals being made to be so extravagant. show offs. You know, forget about the extravagance, just show offs of what? You know, when the, the people are not there for you. You know, Mzwake Mbule has a, 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 you know, a, a poem that says, Give me roses while I'm alive, when I can smell them. Don't come to my grave and throw a, some expensive perfumes and release doves and do all sorts of strange things mm. that you know uh, are not even in keeping, right, with the person that who, who's passed away. So big lesson there, Heidi. I hear a lot of people already say, "Hey, I also want just a basic thing." I think that will that will if if we did that, we will pay so much tribute to him. Mm. Because remember, the tribute is not going to be paid by the leaders and politicians. If we resign it to politicians, it's not going to happen. Mm. It's about how each one of us is going to to grow their conscience just a little bit mm -hmm. to deal with things where they can make a difference, whether it be it in your church or in your school, at the gym, everywhere where you see something wrong, racism, tribalism, xenophobia, fight it. That way, each of us will pay a little bit of a tribute to him and make sure that his tribute, his, his legacy lives on mm. forever. And I think also what really stood out, uh, what Dr. Rampele said, was that we shouldn't be sad that a leader like the Arch is gone. We should take from what he, uh, the qualities he had and how he led and also pave that kind of way Absolutely. for future generations. Just lastly, yeah. uh, Dr. Tabane, speak to us about your fondest memories with the Arch. I, I love <sighs> hearing these stories because even yeah. when we spoke to the former president, he said he blessed my marriage and I thought that was such a lovely story Absolutely. that we often don't hear. Yeah. I, quickly, I had two doses of, of, of Desmond Tutu. Firstly, I was president of the Anglican students and then he was the Archbishop at that time. Obviously, you know, there was, a, a, you know, a, a, almost 90 percent of the bishops were, were white people. As a youngster, 23, I came there to fight them about, you know, give us, give more money to young people, you know, uh, stop this thing about the ordination of women being a taboo, etc. And then he said to me, but they can hear you. He chose to Setswana, my language, and he <laughs> and says, but they can hear you, but who they don't fight? You know, <laughs> so he used, always uh, you know, advised us to temper ourselves in, if you want to get what you want from the bishops. So big lesson there, and that's what I was saying to colleagues earlier this morning, that he knew how to navigate the extremes. You can imagine if we put a range of white bishops in a room and you bring a young black student activist, mm. there could be trouble anytime, right? The second dose was that he was chancellor of the University of the Western Cape when I was president of the SRC. Uh, in the mid 90s uh, then students were in riot etc and he said you again you know and uh, then he got me to say you, stu you must make sure the students go back to class i'll sort out whatever they're complaining about with management so he knew i mean here you've got management of a university mm -hmm. students always a conflict uh, you know all, always mm -hmm. so he came there as a coming voice to both sides to get us as radical student activists to come down and be able to focus on how we can create solutions. Unfortunately, at that time, or fortunately, we're in what we call the, the transition. I mean, we, we were just a year into uh, the new democratic order. And, you know, students had to learn to say, you've got to negotiate things. Now you can't just bend down the place every time there is a problem. So those are my two doses of, 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 of two, two, and forever I shall be grateful I, my, my paths crossed with his. Certainly very powerful doses as well. Thank you so much for your insights and being with us uh, throughout the morning. That is uh, Dr. JJ Tabane.